I grew up living this perfect filtered life where you don't let people know that dad's at home drinking. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes and welcome back to Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. In this episode, I'm talking with JC Dupree. The influencer, creative director, and entrepreneur talks about growing up the daughter of an alcoholic, her type A personality, and her past fears about motherhood. I hope you enjoy this intimate conversation we titled, Not In Control Enough. Also stay tuned for an afterthought from me after the interview. Welcome, JC Dupree, to Not Blank Enough. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here. I guess let's start off by telling everyone how we know each other, which was, and we definitely met through the blogging world. I hate the word influencer, so I'm not going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I feel like when we started, that wasn't even a word anyway, so it's fine. I know. I feel like we met at E. Did we meet at E first? I feel like our our paths crossed when we were working at E, but like we really didn't like really hang until we were at these like blogger events. Wait, how do you think we met? I thought it was just from events, but I I do remember now that you worked at E and I had a small stint where I was filling in for Amy Pathrath on E! News Now. I did meet a lot of E! people then. LA is such a small world. Everyone knows everyone in LA. Exactly. But we did get to, we did get closer because of blogging. And we got much closer from blogging and we did a, a project together that was kind of like a self-made collaboration with Heidi Merrick. Remember that? The oh holiday? My God, <laughs> yes. That was our first like, oh, that was so fun. It was fun. I had a, I look back at that video sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, the we times were so have young. changed. <laughs> we were so young and like just drinking champagne and video, like videoing us just like basically having a Christmas party, a holiday party. <laughs> Oh, remember God, that? Will we, will we ever get to do that again? <laughs> Can we go back to that time, please? Exactly, oh, exactly. God. And then, and then we actually got to do a few projects together. We would get cast like together for stuff. That's a lot, true, actually. People which really loved cool. us together. <laughs> I loved it because it's like I'm working with a friend, and it never felt like work. The Brahmin deal. I remember. I feel like that was our last bigger one that we did together. Yeah, remember, yeah, that was really, really fun. Yeah, it's it's just so much easier when you're working with someone that. It's chill and your friend and I hate like forced mm-hmm. collaboration, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, which happens a lot. I feel like in yeah. that world. But tell me more. Tell us more about JC, like the beginnings of JC, your your childhood, your upbringing, like how we've oh been <laughs> doing this. Is yeah, we've been talking. I've been talking to people, you know, about general not enoughness, but making them get super specific about what that blank is you know, sometimes it comes in and out throughout your life. And sometimes it's the one thing that's throughout your life, but sometimes it changes. And so just kind of exploring that idea from as early as your childhood. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot. Actually, ironically, I had a call with my therapist this morning. And I was like, hmm, like, so did I. <laughs> you did? Oh my I God. Did. <laughs> Thursday's the day. It's great. It's right for the weekend. Get that mind straight. Love, love a good therapy sesh. And I'm like, what? I, you know, I, I kind of touched upon it. I'm like, when this podcast and like, there's a lot that I'm, I feel like I'm not, you know, blank enough with smart enough, mothering, mothering enough, uh, wifely mm-hmm. enough, successful enough, well-read enough. I mean, there's so many things, right? Um, I think the kind of overall underlying constant for me in my life from childhood till now that I just kind of keep circling back to is I'm just not, I'm Gracie, I'm just not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> just not good enough at anything. Uh, you know, just overall, I feel like I am very, 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 very hard on myself. I beat myself up. I put myself down. I'm a worst critic. And to take it all the way back to the beginning, I think it stems from obviously my childhood and this story that I've written in my mind as to you know who I think I am as a person. But really, it's that I was the daughter of an alcoholic growing up. And so I took on the role of being the quote, perfect daughter Mm -hmm. and try to, you know, not give my dad an excuse to drink. So I was in every club. I was captain of the cheerleading team and swimming and I did pageants (laughs) growing up. Oh my God, you did pageants? I I did pageants. I have photos I'll send you. It's hilarious. Hilarious. So yeah, I think I just took on this. um, Many children of alcoholics take on different ways of coping with their parents' alcoholism um, luckily mine wasn't like by lashing out or going and doing anything too dangerous. Mine, what my way of coping was 
trying to be so good that I wouldn't give my dad an excuse to drink. Like, don't drink because I'm failing class and Mm. don't drink because I'm not, you know, a good kid. So I was just trying to always be good. And now that my dad has been sober for, geez, 12 years, I still struggle with that inner critic and that inner voice that, you know, I'm I'm just not good enough because he's still drinking and he never stopped. He didn't stop for the longest time. So Mm. that's kind of the, the core of the core of the core, but it definitely bleeds into every area of my life. Knowing you as I do and knowing like all the things you do and you're so good at all those things, I would challenge you to say, maybe the narrative isn't I'm not good enough, but maybe it's I'm not kind enough to myself. Um, Because I do feel like, yeah, it sounds like you're very hard on yourself. And I won't accept that you're not good enough. I don't need to pay my therapist. I'll just call you. Okay, good. (laughs) No, yeah, that's something that we, I've been seeing my my therapist now for three years. I've been going to therapy since I was very young, um, just for various reasons, stemming from ADD to obviously my dad and alcoholism. And then I had some mild uh, encounters with sexual abuse with a high school uh, football player. And Mm. so just all those things, like just dealing with that throughout my life. But the the therapist I work with now who I love, you know, we're we're down to the nitty gritty. And it is. It's it's all about the healing begins with self-compassion. And Mm -hmm. when you finally like let when you finally submit and let go of working to please others or doing whatever you can in your power to be perfect for other people, you're finally able to better serve yourself. And so that's something that has come with time and work and meditation and Pilates and working out, you know, like things that just kind of clear the space for me to allow for myself to be just more, more self-love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for sharing all that personal stuff with me. Yeah. (laughs) No, it's great because I think so often it's funny. You know, I'm in L.A., so most of my friends are in L.A. And when you start a podcast, you're, you know, begging your friends to be on it to start (laughs) with. And so a lot of people, I feel like in Los Angeles, of course, work in some form of entertainment or some form of outwardness where they have a following or they have people who Mm -hmm. look up to them. I think it's really good for people to know that these people they quote unquote look up to or admire or follow you know, we're not perfect. We all come from crazy backgrounds and no one had a perfect childhood and shit goes down. And that's what makes us different and unique and wonderful and special. And so I think it's really cool that you can share that stuff so easily, you know? That's that's so nice of you to say. And I, I just, um, the more I kind of open up and share what's really going on behind the filtered lens of Instagram, mm-hmm. uh, just the, the more freeing it is. And I still have yet to really open up the doors. Like, I'll talk about it from time to time, but I'm not like posting on Instagram, like, Hey guys, just dealing with my personal anxiety today in my closet. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just not something that I'm as proactive as I would like to be. It's something I'm working on doing and also kind of figuring out a way to bring more of that like mental health awareness into my brand right now. Right. Um, and also like the other activism and things that we're working on behind the scenes, which no one sees. And it's such a shame, mm-hmm. but the life that we share on Instagram and my blog, as unfiltered as I'm trying to have it feel, it's still very, very filtered. And cutting through those filters and those lenses, is it's it takes a lot of time. So when things are happening in the world, uh, whether it be a pandemic or Black Lives Matters or anything, it's you can't just hit like reset on a you know eight nine years of building this brand. Right. It takes time, and so that's that's a struggle. Well, it's like you have to like gr- gradually introduce your audience to this like new not new you but I guess deeper understanding of who you are yeah it's exactly like that you don't want to scare people either you know I I recently a couple months ago wrote about how I got some embryos frozen I Mm -hmm. I went through just typical like IVF process well my my family they kind of my mom especially she kind of like freaked out a little she's like you're really going to share this with everyone and I'm like well yeah (laughs) because it's honest and it's the truth and it will help other people so there's definitely part of me that that still struggles with sharing because I grew up living this, like I said, perfect filtered life where you don't let people know the dad's at home drinking. You know, we don't we don't want people to know that. Right. As scary as it is for me to share these things, I haven't gotten anything but positive feedback. And honestly, like it feels good to share your story and help other people. Otherwise, what in the hell are we doing? 
why have this big audience if you're not using your voice to make any difference? And so the more I'm able to practice that, the better it feels, you know, uh, overall. Yeah, and it lets people know they're not alone because there's definitely other women out there who are going through similar situations and then they see you and they're like, oh, okay. Like, it just feels like, oh, yeah, there are other women. Yeah. It is hard. I mean, I, I did the same. I talked all about my infertility and IVF journey and then even did a short film about it. Yeah, which I love. I admire that so much. I I love that you put that out there. Thank you. But then I did come to a – well, it's funny. I just did someone else's podcast a couple weeks ago, um, Spermcast, it's called. And it's this woman I know who's a comedian. And she started a podcast, I think, about a year and a half ago because she was looking for a sperm donor. And she had had eggs that she had frozen. And so she made a podcast about it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, And so she had asked me to be on it. I said yes. And I did it. And I was glad to do it because I did feel like, well, a lot has changed for me in my journey. And Mm -hmm. I haven't spoken about it. So there was a part of me that was like, damn, I wish I didn't share all this before, because now I feel like I kind of owe it to people to be like, this is where I'm at now. And I would get random Mm -hmm. messages from people asking me how it was going and if I was still trying and wishing me well and trying to have a baby. And little did they know I wasn't trying to have a baby anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it feels it is a catch 22 when you share so much of your life, because then you almost have to keep on sharing. Yeah, once you open the floodgates, there's no turning back. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, yeah, I try to be as aware of it without, you know, without withholding things that we're actually going through. So yeah, you're right. It is a catch-22. And it's fascinating, but it's also so amazing that it brings us all together. And and it's been amazing, Mm -hmm. you know, through this pandemic even. And it's out of control, but it's also amazing. <laughs> you know, like people <laughs> right. are flat out out of control and the cancel culture and everything that's going on right now is it's crazy. I find myself, yeah. I, I used to be, you know, on my phone all day, every day. It's what I do for a living, but I, I really check out. It's actually kind of nice. I, I really am not on social media as much as I, as I used to be because it's just, it's, it's gotten really toxic, but it's also gotten really, it's also gotten really great. Cause I've made some new friends. Mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh my God, this girl posted, I, I have a random friend who I met one time at an event and she posted about an experience, something that I'm going through. And I was like, this is so cool. I don't know many women that are going through this. And then we started DMing and now we had a phone call yesterday and she's like, I can't wait to get together. I'm like, this is awesome. Cause she shared something personal. So you just never know, you know, it's a, it's a great way to To meet new people, too, especially during a pandemic. I know, this pandemic. Lordy. Um, (laughs) Lordy. Okay, so you told us a little bit about your childhood into high school. And then at what point did you move to Los Angeles? And and, um, tell us a little bit about that experience and coming here. Because you're from Texas, yes? I am. I'm born and raised in Texas. My family's been there forever. Um, My parents grew up there. My grandparents grew up there. I was like, all right, peace. And so I left Texas and went to college in Chicago. Chicago was the only big city I'd ever visited outside of the state of Texas. And my aunt lived there. So I was like, sweet. I know someone. Chicago is a pretty small city. Uh, It feels like a big, small town, really. And so I I went to school there and I started working in just like various news slash entertainment jobs. Um, I worked at WGN for a little while, the Oprah Winfrey show there. And then it was freezing, like flat out freezing. (laughs) And so I was like, I got to get out. And so I drove. My best friend and I loaded up the car and we drove across country, which is just, I'll never forget that drive. And I moved to Los Angeles, I want to say it was like 12 years ago now, 13, 12, 13 years ago. And um, I got a job at E! E! News and I fought for the job. I was like, I'll do anything. Just let me in. Like, (laughs) it was just sounded like the coolest place to work in LA that wasn't like film production because I had no idea how to do film, but I had worked for television companies in Chicago. Um, like NBC, WGN. So I was like, I had that on my resume and entertainment news just sounded like a blast. So I finally got a job there. Thank thank God. Cause it, um, I met you, I met Kat, I met all my besties <laughs> and uh, I kind of formed this network of support that, that kept me here. And then I actually started my blog when I was working at E, um, but it was literally just like text. Here's what I'm wearing today. Cause I would walk in and our supervising producer or Kat or Lena or whoever would be like, wait, where'd you get your top? And where'd you get your shoes? And how did you, <laughs> how did you know to put this and this together? And so I finally was just like, go visit the blog. And it was just jclinnae.com at the time. And then wait, I, what's the Linnae? 
That's my middle name. Oh, cute. I'm okay. actually going to it right now to make sure I own it. Okay, I do. <laughs> I'm crazy with domains. I like buy them when I'm drunk. So nice. Uh, yeah, I'm, I have a lot. They're my they're my biggest uh, asset. I'm just kidding. So we, I quit E. I just didn't want to be talking about celebrities' lives and you know fights and waiting outside of the bars for them to come out and this was back in like mm. the TMZ prime with Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan going to the bars and we were all up in that it just felt kind of like icky yeah you know mm. like i don't want to be like stalking these people down for their personal life details yeah so i decided to switch gears and try out the film industry i'd been here for a few years and i knew a couple people in the biz who helped me land a job at Brian Grazer so i was his assistant for a short amount of time. <laughs> wow. Um, and that sounds I, like a really <laughs> intense job. It was very, very intense. For people who may not know who Brian Grazer is. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. <laughs> I feel like if you see his face, you'll know. He did like all the big ones. He did A Beautiful Mind, The Da Vinci Code. I oh, mean, yeah. he's... Big time producer. Yeah. Ron Howard is his partner. He's been making movies and TV for over 25 years. And he's just like... He's the the producer in Hollywood. When I tell people here I work for him, they're like, whoa, (laughs) are you okay? No, but he's he's a really nice guy. Um, Parenthood, Arrested Development. He's a great guy. It was so fun to watch his brain and like work and and Mm. just like see him work. I was like, listen, I'm not going to be a film producer. I didn't love waking up and, and working in that industry every day. I was definitely in the prime place for it if that was what I wanted to do, but it just didn't feel right. And I just always, I don't know, when it, when it came to like doing a job and, and working, I, I was, I witnessed my dad wake up every single day and love what he does for a living. He loves farming. Hmm. He loves it. And it doesn't seem like he has a job. And my mom was the same way. She loves music. She has her master's degree in music education. So she would go and teach music all day. So my parents set this example very early on that your work shouldn't feel like work. It, you know, mm. it should never be like that. And you should really love what you're doing in your life. And I appreciate that example because it has led me to push myself in, in the direction of this crazy new industry of blogging, which I probably wouldn't have never trusted. I would have just stuck with like my job that made me money. Right. But I left that job. <laughs> and, uh, and just like through a, a short time of being unemployed and kind of making freelance gigs for myself, I slowly started to make money off of this blog. And then here we are nine years later, which is just the ups crazy. and downs. It's just, yeah, it's really crazy. And throughout these changes in like from E to Brian Grazer to deciding to go off on your own, going back to like the theme of not enoughness, was there ever a feeling of that? Oh my God. I mean, yeah, like every day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, from the very beginning to just not being good enough at the photography, the CSS coding, like I took Photoshop classes and HTML coding classes. I just felt like I was always behind in terms of developing the actual layout of the site. This was before, you know, I even had an Instagram. So Mm -hmm. I was very, I geeked out to the design of it and like, it's just not good enough. It's not going to be good enough. I, I don't know what I'm doing. From that to finally breaking into the industry and then my work not being good enough, I was beating myself up over my outfits not being cute enough. I mean, it's just, it's stupid stuff every day, but then it also bleeds into, you know, the bigger picture life stuff. Am I setting a good enough example? Am I working in a, I hate to say it, but Mm -mm. is my job good enough? Like, am I going to walk away from nine years of posting pictures of myself and feel good about that. I, I, you know what I mean? Like, is it, yeah. like, I don't, I, I got to tell you, there's some days where I'm like, no, like, Oh, what do I do? What do I do? How do I contribute to this world as a whole, especially lately that has been the, right. You know, am I, am I contributing to society? Am I making a difference? Am I empowering people? Am I volunteering enough? Am I reading enough? It's, it weighs heavily because our life, my, my career, our lives, uh, Grant and myself in June, we built a career off of just sharing, you know, outfits and trips and beauty yeah. and mm-hmm. oh, slap happy and here's us dancing in the kitchen. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and I'm just at the end of the day, you're like, wow, what did I give people to take away today other than maybe a smile? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> I relate to you so much because I do think we are very similar beasts when it comes to our work ethic and like work, 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 and getting things done and being uh, 
very good at starting and completing a task and making sure that that task is as good as it possibly can be. And that drive for me is that same feeling that you're saying of like, is this good enough? What am I doing with, in, with my life? What am I putting out in the world? So my very first episode was with Marie Forleo, and we talked about this feeling of not feeling good enough. And Marie, I would say, is the only other person I could think of besides you, JC, who is just such a entrepreneur, go-getter, makes shit happen, is building an empire type of woman. And something that we all three have in common is this thing of like constantly doubting mm -hmm. <laughs> how yeah. good we are or like what we are, what constantly striving for, for, for greatness, I think is also the thing. It's always like, I can be better. This can be, be better. I can put better things out in the world. I can make things better. Yeah. Well, you know that there's like a quote, it's something along the lines of that. There's nothing stronger than a broken woman who's had to rebuild herself over and over and over again. It's like, mm. it's not, it's, that's why we're successful is because it's just never going to be enough. So, you know, you also yep. have to appreciate the flaw if, if you want to call it a flaw or just find power within it, because I definitely wouldn't be here in this life, in this house, in this LA and my marriage if I didn't sometimes feel that way because it, you know, it's kept me competitive with myself in many ways and kept me um, trying, you know, is my marriage yeah. good enough? I should try to do something special tonight because I'm, which is, which is good sometimes, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's good to, to come back to that from time to time. But when you're sitting in the closet floor, really beating yourself up and, and it definitely came out um, very much when I was pregnant, it was like mm -hmm. very strong. I was so hard on myself. Because my body was changing. I couldn't control anything, Gracie. Right. I'd be like, I'm going to do this today. Nope. <laughs> Your body has different plans for you. And I just did not. It was such a learning lesson. I had no Ooh. control. Talk horrible. to me more about that. Because, again, <laughs> <laughs> Marie doesn't want to have kids. I'm at the stage now where I don't think I want to have kids. And now here you are, the, the third person that I can think of that's very similar. And you did have a baby and yeah. you, the things you're saying to me right now are all the things I yeah. was terrified of when I thought about having a kid because I think we are very much um, type A kind of control freaks mm -hmm. and you have no control when it comes to None. a child. Yeah, it was my biggest fear and it came true. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all right. But uh, no, during the pregnancy, it was, I think, the hardest after we had our daughter, June, it became a little easier because you, you know, you have the prize in your hands. So it's like, okay, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you're pregnant, especially with your first baby, I, I didn't know. And I didn't know that that wasn't not normal or normal or if, are the feelings I have, you know, valid. It's, does everyone feel this way? And they just lying that their pregnancy is amazing. <laughs> I think that I'm just, I, for lack of a better word, and I, I'm okay with June hearing this one day. Like, I hated it. I hated mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't want to complain about it during the time because I know how lucky we are. But the actual emotions and, and the fears that you're saying even you have just thinking about it, that it's, it's it happens. It's valid. And I would just yeah. – I would do things like – I would get so frustrated because I couldn't control what was happening with my body or my mind that I would have these explosions of rage – uh -huh. which like my therapist had to work with me on. We had to like learn ways to cope with my inner rage. And she uh -huh. was like, um, in, in Chinese medicine, they say that people feel rage because it's stemming from their liver. And so we need to get your liver. I'm like, well, my liver's not getting alcohol. So yes, I'm, I'm in a rage. I'm not happy because I need my wine. <laughs> so of course I'm angry. And so we learned to like push up against a wall. If I start to like feel the, the feeling rise, I still do it. I'll push up against mm. a wall. You have to like physically let it out somehow. Interesting. When I was pregnant, I would like get the ice maker and like throw ice in the kit like hard all over the floor and be like, Rah! and Grant's like, oh my God, she's <laughs> possessed. <laughs> like what happened to my wife? And I'm like, Rah! I was just so, I had to get it out. I had to get like this feeling out. And so I would physically exert myself. I did things like the ice. I threw our front lawn furniture all over, all over the front yard one day, our four neighbors. And then my closet, I completely ripped it apart once. I mean, I was just being a psychopath, basically. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love hearing this because I can picture it. I can, you can picture myself me. doing it. You can, yeah. you can picture me in my closet, just ripping clothes off the shelf, throwing the hairs. Oh, my God. It really is, I think, a control, like a, a control thing. Yes. Because I was like, I can... 
oh, maybe it's not not in control enough. <laughs> yeah, that's that's of- my thing. I'm not in control enough. I have zero control. I love to be in control. Yeah, that's – and you know what? Going – I mean, I'm not a therapist at all, but I've been therapy for the last two or three years, and I love my therapist. And talking about, you know, everything stems from your childhood. We all know this. Um, and so because of the – imbalances Mm -hmm. in my childhood I was very much kind of like you actually I very much like school was very important I had to get good grades Mm -hmm. I went to Catholic school and I I, the number one memory I have (laughs) was that I would come home I would be in my uniform and I would just start doing my homework and my mom would be like Gracie can you change out of your clothes and maybe eat something and just relax and I'm like nope mom I have to get my homework (laughs) like it was like I was yeah I was like I have to get to work I was explained to me that that is like a coping mecha- a coping mechanism to like have that you have control over that. So anything that you can have control over, yeah, that helps you feel like you're in control. Oh, one hundred percent. Like Grant and I, we always joke about it. It's like a well known thing w- between us. Like I will spend all night researching something, even stuff that we're not even doing. Like it's <laughs> it's so stupid. Like I researched the other day, like houses in Valley Village, and I'm like, we're not moving to Valley Village. We love our house, but like. I did like five hours of (laughs) researching, like what's the weather like in Valley Village? And then I got twisted off. Like what are the safest places to live in the U S and I was like, Oh my God, Manhattan beach is one of the safe. I'm just like, and I just like get obsessed because earlier that day, something happened that I couldn't control and it kind of threw me off. And so that's, it's almost like a drug in a weird way. It's like, I need that hit of control to stay Mm -hmm. like equalized, you know? So yeah, it's been it's been both a blessing and I'd just say more of a blessing than anything to 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 have gone through the pregnancy, especially now to be a mom, to have just that constant daily slap in the face that <laughs> I am not in control because it, it has softened me tremendously. Because I the tighter I hold on to like this control idea, um, the the more I kind of spiral out of control, to be honest, you know, Mm -hmm. my life doesn't feel balanced, but yeah, it definitely stems from the childhood. Couldn't control my dad drinking. So I'm going to be able to control everything else in my life. Right. That way I don't feel sad or broken or. And it totally makes sense. And you also are married to Grant, who is such a, well, at least from what I can see or have experienced, like such a chill, kind of laid back kind of guy. Poor Grant. <laughs> but it makes oh. sense because it's like you couldn't have two control freaks in a relationship. No, Grant is so laid back and just so accepting of every single flaw that I have. I've never met anyone that just accepts me for me and all of the me's that are you know, coming around the corner from now. He, Grant definitely has his own insecurities, you know, and his own stuff, but he's taught me how to sit with insecurities rather than Mm -hmm. fight against them. And rather than push up against something, he's like, let's just sit with it for a minute. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I'm going to go Google it. Let's Google this insecure. And he's like, no, let's just chill. I'm like, okay. Wow. Yeah. I totally see that. And so now with motherhood, Oh, my God. By the way, June is, like, <laughs> beyond. Like, she is, like, the cutest little angelic. Like, oh she's, like, God. a Gerber baby. Oh, my God. I'm glad you think that. You need to come see her because she's, like, crazy. <laughs> she's crazy, Gracie. That's great. I love that. I, like, I love little crazy girls especially. Yep. She's she's a wild one. That's great. She's, like, a mama. Her mama's exactly. a mama. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not, not going to try to tame her. I know better. I know better. <laughs> but what is that like having this? you know, control stuff, type A-ness and, and a baby. Cause at first it was tough. I had to kind of check myself a lot, um, especially in the beginning, but now I feel like Grant and I, we're getting the, we're getting the groove. She's a year and a half now. And we kind of know what to look for whenever I'm having one of those days where it's just building and building and building on top of each other before I like kind of snap. I have to leave the house at least once a day. I mean, I know we're in quarantine and it's it's challenging, but even if it just means getting out for a walk, I noticed the days where I'm not like getting out of the house and this applies for everyone. I mean, you got to just move your body, I think, because it, it helps your mind kind of clear. For sure. But yeah, we, we just kind of know those little things, those little tricks, those little triggers um, to look for. But all in all, like it's so, it's just so surprising. I mean, you knew me before, you've known me forever and we've had conversations where I'm like, I don't know if I want to have a baby. This is Mm -hmm. scary. And Grant and I have gone through the, 
you know, the whole process, we've talked to you and Damien about it um, at the dinner table, you know, we're like, wow, this is, it's knocking on the door. But yeah, overall, like dealing with the control factor as a parent, I mean, I feel like it's something that probably everyone has to deal with. Mine's just maybe a little bit more (laughs) heightened. (laughs) So, you know, you manage it just like you manage everything else. And anyone that's ever gone through any sort of trauma in their lives or any sort of, you know, major event that's going to be a struggle for them, anyone that experiences that knows it's going to be a circular battle. It's going to be something you always come back to in your life. It's not just going to go away, but hopefully... Each time you come back to it, you're stronger and you feel more knowledgeable than the last time. So mm-hmm. that, that's the same thing with her, with June. It's every time we, we kind of hit this hurdle with anything, I know it's nothing new. It's, you know, it's not going to catch me off guard as much as it did in the beginning. Well, it's interesting because um, when Damon, Damon and I have been together for 13 years now, and when we got together, he had two cats and I had my dog Hayden who passed away last year and I am not a cat person. (laughs) And um, it was almost a deal breaker that he even had cats. He had two cats, no less. These two cats are still around. They're still kicking. And and I realized it's not that I don't like cats because I love animals and and I, and you know, they're adorable. It's that cats have no boundaries. Cats will jump on anything, can reach anything are just kind of crazy. I don't really trust them. And I was like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, dogs can be trained. And dogs, you know, you don't want them to reach something. (laughs) You put it a little higher up on the shelf. Uh And it's good. But, like, cats. They're unpredictable. Yeah, they're unpredictable. And that really, like, checked me with the whole, like, baby stuff, honestly. Mm Because I was just like, oof. And now we have a puppy. (laughs) We have Charlie, our puppy. And it's like I'm starting to feel that same kind of stuff, like, Puppies are crazy. Puppies are like little two-year-olds running around. They oh yeah get into everything. They you have to give them boundaries. You have to put them in their crate. You have to kind of like train them and, and go through this whole process with them. It can be exhausting and it can be it can really trigger my anxiety because oh, I yeah. do have that same like no 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 everything needs to be in its place and I have to be in control of everything and blah 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 blah. That's so funny you say that. Cats are just like babies. <laughs> because it's true it's true it's true and you know I'm a dog person I I I was not that girl that grew up being like I'm gonna be a mom I want babies and that I'm gonna be that girl and I I'm only saying that to be honest because Mm -hmm. I know that I'm not the only person that feels that way but I did take the leap of faith in the game of life and you know I don't regret it by any means it's not going to be this like picture perfect motherly beacon of strength and love and Mm -mm. I'm a mother now like that's not how it is you know I'm still me and I still have my baggage and I'm filtering through it I'm trying my best and that's what's really going on behind the scenes (laughs) yeah Yeah. the cat thing is I love that that's so funny that you said that because it's it's spot on like they're unpredictable you can't control you can't train them like we had all of our dogs really well trained (laughs) I know. <laughs> Miss those days. I, I know. Dogs are the best. So, okay, so how are you feeling like, I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but if you look back on your life and you look back on this theme of not enoughness, we talked about not feeling good enough, maybe not feeling in control enough. Today, how is JC feeling? Today, JC's feeling more empowered, I would say, than I have in a really long time. Um, in the beginning of COVID-19, I felt empowered but then I went through a phase where I felt very just at a loss and sad and out of control and helpless and sad and helpless and sad Mm -hmm. and I and I was just kind of frozen with what to do and and I feel like today can't say how I'll feel in two weeks from now (laughs) (laughs) but today I feel very empowered I've finally started reading again which was something I just like could I just couldn't I just froze Yeah. when all of this was happening, Espe- especially when the Black Lives Matters movement started to kind of increase in momentum. Mm-hmm. I, I really, I almost just like shut down and not, not in a way where I wasn't doing anything or helping behind the scenes and working, but just like, I, I felt such empathy for the world as a whole. Like, it, oh God, I just, it makes me feel sick to my stomach, you know? It's a lot. I mean, it's... It's interesting. I do think like the Black Lives Matter movement wouldn't be having such an impact right now if it wasn't for COVID because mm-hmm. it is forcing people to to really deal with what's been going on for hundreds of years. But it's like, no, no one can just go to work tomorrow and pretend nothing's happening. Like you're you're 
inundated with it every single day, which I think is is good. And even though, you know, things are slowly getting slower or things are slowing down as far as that goes, I think it does feel more like a movement this time around. And people are actually making day-to-day changes rather than just, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to post a black box and be done with it. No, people are actually making changes and doing things, which is really wonderful. At the end of the day, it is a lot to take for everyone, whether you're white or black or male or female or, you know, straight or gay. It's just, it's just a lot to take. A global pandemic is enough to take, but Mm -hmm. you put that on top of what's going on in the world, our administration, our Black Lives Matter. It's just like, wow. Where to be at? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, and that's why I think self-care right now is, is so important and more important than ever, I should say. Yeah, well, it's a great timing for your podcast too, because I feel like that's kind of the you know the overall overall um, arc of your of your podcast, and I, I can't agree with you more that this isn't new news. Unfortunately, sadly, um, all of these issues aren't new, mm-hmm. but the, the fact that we have been um, holed up as a, as the world has been in this quarantine, it definitely has. I think, and I agree with you, shed more light onto these topics because we have to sit with it. Just like we Mm -hmm. just sit with what's uncomfortable about ourselves. We just sit with that control issue. We just sit with whatever it is. We're having to sit with this reality. And it's, I hate to say it, but it's it's a really, it's a damn good thing. It's a damn Mm -hmm. good thing. And and as much as I hate COVID-19, I fucking hate it more than anything. It's literally, it's it's horrible. Mm -hmm. This is a, a sliver, a small sliver of a silver lining is that hopefully, and I'm optimistic that this will be the case. Hopefully it's some, this will be the good that comes out of it is that yeah. we are more focused on, on humanity as a whole and that we care about one another as a whole. I, I pray that, that, that that's the case. I really do. I know it's <laughs> definitely a roller coaster. There's definitely days where I'm like, this is good. This is good. Yeah. People are starting to care. And then there's days where like, mm-hmm someone's yelling at someone because they don't want to wear a mask and then I just want to kill everybody. <laughs> people are really, they're so, people are so angry right now. People are so angry. Mm-hmm. People are so angry and sad and uh, we can go on, on forever on that. But going back to JC. But yeah, so, so how am I doing today? The answer is, is I feel optimistic because when I'm looking at the world, it's pretty hard to sit here and be like, hmm, oh, poor, I'm just not good enough for me. I, I feel empowered by what's going on. You know, I feel empowered and and that's my personality type. Like, let's get to work. Put me in coach. Yeah. Like, let's do something about it. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and cry. I want to, I want to get back into the, into the arena, you know, and that's the, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not whatever that's, that's fueling me. So, you know, learn from your, from your weaknesses, I guess is the, the takeaway. Yeah. And I, I love that because you are a go-getter. Like that's the one thing I admire about you. Even when I was working in the blogger space more, I mean, I've pulled away from it a bunch, but when I was really in it, you were definitely one of the people, (laughs) one of the only people that I would look to because you have a great balance of I'm working my ass off to build my brand, but you also keep it pretty like to me I think authentic and you're not just posting a photo of a latte because everyone's posting a photo of a latte like you were really (laughs) trying to like make it your own thing which I always really admired and appreciated thank you and that goes back to just like that work ethic which also comes from our (laughs) yeah I mean birds of a birds of a feather (laughs) birds of a feather (laughs) flock together what can I say right 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 yeah what's going on with you now as far as work Um, well, I'm still blogging, (laughs) still working, have some fun partnerships. Um, but outside of like work, fashion blogging, what to wear on a Tuesday, we, uh, (laughs) we're working really closely right now to strategize a a strong rollout for the election season. Oh, nice. I've never done that in the past. I just have kind of sat in my little pageant seat and said the nice, Mm -hmm. what I'm supposed to say and crossed my T's and dotted my I's, but Not anymore. (laughs) I'm coming out. I will not sit back this election season and just watch shit unfold. So I'm going to be very proactive partnering with Vote.org on that. And then we're also, um, I'm up for consideration to be on a board of an organization um, locally, actually. It's called Noah's Foundation. So I'm working with them on a local level. Yeah. I'd be the, oh, you'll love this. I'll be the only white person. (laughs) <laughs> so part of it was so great. I got the call and she was like, well, we would love to consider you to be on our board because we need to add some diversity to our board. And I was like, that's awesome. 
I would love to, like, I could be the diverse. Isn't that funny? I'm like, that's so funny because most people right now are doing the opposite. I'm like, right. sweet, great. So put me in. That's amazing. And, you know, that's like a perfect example. Like, I love that you're doing something for the election because one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'll just, I'm just going to call them trolls. When trolls on the <laughs> internet and Instagram and all these places love to tell influencers and actors and, and like, to stay, quote, quote, in yeah. their lane. And mm-hmm. that, to me makes me so angry, especially when a lot of those people are supporting a president who was a reality star. So, so, so we don't have to get political about it, but just like (laughs) the fact that people can like say that to you or say that to any of us is just, it's like, I am no less American and (laughs) no less have the right to free speech than you do because of my profession. No, I could not agree with you more. And it's something that I get enraged, like when when people are like, just stick to, you know, just stick to posting about fashion. I'm like, that's not fair. (laughs) I'm a person. I'm a person with a voice and a life and a gay brother, for Christ's sake. Like, come on, people. Like, I'm I'm not going to just sit back. I I have, regretfully so, for quite a long time. And it's, it's just time for a change. For sure. And it's, it's funny. I've had my Instagram since the beginning of Instagram. So I don't know eight, nine, 10 years that's been. Yeah. And it hasn't been until the last couple of, well, probably the last six months, maybe three months that I'm getting the occasional troll. Not, not, not too bad. It hasn't gotten too bad. But I was like, because yeah, because I'm speaking out Mm -hmm. now and I'm talking about Black Lives Matter and what what it means to be a woman of color and what it means to be Afro-Latina and what it means in the racism I've experienced and people like can't handle it. (laughs) No way. (laughs) I'm a person. I have experiences. I can share those too. Yeah. Keep going. And I, you know, I try to always find some sort of, I, you know, you guys are the same way. I always try to find some sort of humor in every situation. So mm-hmm. just to help me, just to help me get through it. And like you said, like the people that are saying these things are the ones that, you know, elected a reality TV star into right. the office. Right. So it's like, huh, you can't help but just kind of chuckle just, just a little, just the a hypocrisy. little chuckle. Yeah, just a little, okay, okay, let's, let's just take it back. So with every episode, we like to title it something. So I feel like, I really like the idea of the control, the control aspect, because I just feel like that feeds into a little bit of everything that we've discussed. Oh, yeah, for sure. So this might have to be called not in control enough. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm so down. That's I mean, everyone in my life will, will be like, oh, yeah, that's JC. That's me in control. Well, thank you, JC. This has been lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Today's afterthought is a short one about motherhood. It was so refreshing to hear JC talk about it so candidly, as so many people, especially in the influencer space, tend to make it sound like it's all so beautiful and easy all the time. It's not. Nothing about motherhood or trying to be a mom is easy, yet we almost never talk about how hard it is. Infertility, miscarriages, postpartum depression, and how drastically someone's life changes after kids. None of it is ever talked about enough. And I get that it is truly a miracle to have a baby, especially if you're over 35 and no one wants to publicly complain about it. But I think talking about it is really helpful and makes women who are going through these same things feel less alone. So this afterthought is more of a shout out, a shout out to all the moms out there. I know how hard you work and I know how hard it is and I see you. You are a superhero. And if you're not a mom yet, or you're trying to be a mom, or you're not even sure if you want to be a mom and you're struggling with that decision, I really see you because I've been there and I'm here for you. It's why I've always been so public about my infertility journey and my current thoughts on motherhood. So if you want to share your thoughts or support for other women with words of encouragement, please do so by commenting or DMing me on our Instagram page at notblankenoughpod. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Not Blank Enough. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. And follow us on Instagram at Not Blank Enough Pod. Until next time, thank you for listening. Check the show notes for links and info about today's guest. This episode was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and edited by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production.